we close the door and yeah. Okay, we're ready to start. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Tom Cooney. I am Professor of Entrepreneurship at Technological University Dublin in Ireland. Uh, for, for the past seven years, I've been a member of the jury uh, for the European Enterprise Promotion Awards. The European Enterprise Promotion Awards is now 15 years old and is an exciting initiative that promotes uh, good quality, high impact initiatives across Europe. And across the years, one of the things that we've noticed is that at the awards evening, people are celebrating the success of exciting initiatives and I suppose not really understanding you know, exactly what it is that they do and how they can learn from it and potentially how they can replicate that initiative in their home country. So the purpose of today's session is to learn from this year's finalists and we're all online we've got the winner of last year's uh, category which is the, the category that we're dealing with particularly is promoting the entrepreneurial spirit award category one. So online we've got a um, winner from last year and basically the idea is we learn from what they've done and look at how we might replicate their ideas in our home countries. So I'm delighted to welcome to the panel, the, I'll get my notes here, uh, Beatrice Vianney Galvani and Beatrice is with 100,000 entrepreneurs in France and particularly we're going to focus on the work that they do regarding women entrepreneurship and the, I suppose, the, 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 what they're looking to do in terms of changing mentality okay, with young people. So the focus of their work is with young people between the ages of 15 and 24. They work in the schools and surrounding changing mentality. They do a lot of others besides and Beatrice will talk about that also. Next to Beatrice is Anja Zorka from the Centre for Creativity in Slovenia. Um, again, the Centre for Creativity is looking at supporting entrepreneurial activity within the cultural and creative sectors in um, Slovenia. Uh, they have a business accelerator program, but they take quite a holistic approach to the way in which they support entrepreneurial activity within that sector. And with us on stage also is Azir Alea from the Basque Culinary Centre in Spain. Okay, and they promote uh, entrepreneurial activity within the culinary sector. And we're going to talk particularly about their programme Culinary Action. Online, we have Jens Freeholm from, the, um, from DTU Skylab in Denmark. And with Jens, we're going to be talking about their Open Entrepreneurship Initiative, which was quite successful and won the award last year. So that's the background. And I'm going to get started. We're going to build the conversation through kind of four formal blocks. We're going to look at the design of the, uh, or the origin of the idea, then how they gathered the resources, the critical learning points, and how they created sustainability for their initiative. So that's basically the format of what we're looking to achieve here. So let's get started. Beatrice, I'll obviously start with you. 100,000 entrepreneurs, where did that idea come from? Um, hello, everybody. So um, this action, you know, specific on women entrepreneurship is born from an observation and a need in our organization. Nine years ago, the, the network of, our entrepreneur, of entrepreneurs in our organization was made up of 80% of men. And uh, so despite ourselves, we conveyed an almost masculine image of entrepreneurship. And despite our effort, we were unable to mobilize men. Uh, there are lots of breaks for women. And uh, very often they told us, I don't have the time, or my project is not complete, or uh, will come when, when to see the, the young people when my company will be bigger, and, or I'm not legitimate enough. And mobilizing men was much simpler because they, they felt much more confident. And, and yet, you know, it was for us becoming urgent 
to mobilize more women on, on our network. Because first, we had feedback from our entrepreneurs. Uh, we told them that young girls, especially in the suburb, told them that entrepreneurship was not for them. And that later, they would not even be allowed to work. And secondly, uh, lots of studies uh, have shown that young girls made very gender orientation and uh, choice, and that very few chose a career uh, on specific fields like industry or digital or and even less in entrepreneurship. So for all, uh, we really had to do something for these girls, and we need to show, uh, to show them female role model. That's why you know the ID. But for that, we had to do something to have more women in our network. So uh, I told to myself that it was really urgent, absolutely necessary to create a massive, specific and massive action with female role models to go and meet young women and young men, and especially young women, to, uh, and to act like uh, you know, female role models. And, uh, and I thought that maybe um, women's fear toward entrepreneurship will disappear it, if it was a more specific gender um, action. And you know, it worked straight away, really, really straight away. And for the first year, women from everywhere started, started to join us. And uh, each year, the mobilization of women grew. And this year in March, because we are doing this action, especially in March, and we have more than 1,200 women than, uh, that took part in our operation and met more than 35,000 young people to talk about entrepreneurship led by women, to talk about guidance, empowerment, and professional organization, and can, orientation. And can I just ask, Beatrice, uh, your focus is on young people. Why did you choose young people as opposed to, we say, 20 to 30-year-olds? Why did you go for the... We said 15. To yeah, we, we see young people between 13 and 25. And, and you know, it's a sensibilization action, and it's important to go uh, very early, you know, to, to in France, we say, to, to put the little seeds in, yeah. the, in the mind because the, the young people, and especially young uh, girl, has to say, okay, maybe I can do it. Maybe it's for me. And when I see this woman doing this, she's amazing. and maybe I can do it. So that's why we show this, uh, this particular um, um, group. group. Yes. Oh, excellent. And, and, and why did, you know, where did your idea come from? Why the culture and creative sectors particularly? And you know, that's quite a focus. And so I'm just wondering how that idea came about. Um, although uh, the Center for Creativity is uh, quite a young initiative, started in 2017, the actual idea as the seed of this idea came uh, from the first research of cultural and creative sector or uh, creative industries in Slovenia around 2010, uh, where um, the researchers identified that Slovenia creatives and designers would need uh, a center that would develop and support their activities, promote them internationally and so on. So this somehow developed through the years uh, into the initiative uh, that became a part of smart specialization of Slovenia, where in this uh, ecosystem, uh, somehow the government recognized that also creative sector are important for the development of innovation in a country. So uh, Center for Creativity was uh, started then, the initiative uh, actually by the Ministry of culture, uh, in cooperation also with the Ministry of Economics. Uh, and um, so we started to develop a program that would somehow connect industry and creatives. Uh, but because our organization, where I come from, where the center uh, is uh, somehow operating, Museum of Architecture and Design, has been dealing with creative fields for many years. Uh, we are also organizers of Biennial of Design and other projects. We knew what the sector needs. We knew what are the issues and problems on the field, what are the examples uh, abroad that are uh, how they are approaching this uh, problem or how they are create, uh, creating connections uh, or developing support for creative sector. So uh, the Ministry of Culture uh, gave us the task to develop the project and the program. So uh, this how from our needs, from our experiences and the needs from the sector, we developed the programs that we are running now. 
Okay, great. Just, just so I suppose everybody is clear, the center for you know, creativity that was established, that, that established before the ministry no, the, the no, asked for it, no. No, the ministry invited us officially, yeah. uh, the Museum of Architecture and Design, to uh, propose a program uh, for the cohesion project, yeah. uh, Euro European Regional Development Fund. And so we wrote a project, we wrote a program, and this is how this project came about. Okay, but you were already started as an organization, no? Museum of Architecture and Design. Okay, yes, yes. yes. no, yes. Yes. okay, yes. thank you. Yes. Yes. And, and Beatrice, sorry, the 100,000 uh, entrepreneurs, was it a person started that or was it an organization? It's a non-profit organization. Yeah, and, but who started it? Um, and who the founder? Okay, yeah. Yeah, there is a founder named Philippe Ayat that is uh, okay. an entrepreneur, very okay. involved on entrepreneurship. Uh, who saw that yeah. possibility, okay, and, okay, and then the museum. Okay, I'm just trying to work out yeah, yeah. Who, who, who created yeah, the, the, the yeah. initiative. As here, um, the culinary action. Mm -hmm. I, I know you do lots, lots in, the, in, the, in, in, in your organization, mm -hmm. uh, but talk to us a little about, talk to us a little about the organization and then the culinary action initiative. Okay, well, thank you. First of all, hello, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna talk about food right after breakfast, so I guess that helps. <laughs> uh, you say that's a help when I'm next to lunch. Well, the Basque Culinary Center was created about 15 years ago as a bottom-up initiative on which uh, a lot of, uh, mostly chefs, but not just chefs, all over the world thought that uh, there was no university studies on gastronomy field. It was mostly, you look at it, it's mostly vocational training, which is great. But you know, food is actually one of the oldest uh, probably activities of humankind, and we didn't have that. So we are one of the few. There's a, a few others. There's another one in Northern Italy, and that's pretty much it. Uh, we created university, undergrad, masters, and PhD levels, on which actually we have an international uh, board, which is pretty much a who is who of the main chefs in the world. René Repzig from Denmark, uh, Gaston Acurio, et cetera, et cetera. So, Basically, we had something that attracted talent from all over the world on gastronomy. And what's gastronomy? Pretty much anything from agriculture all the way to fine cuisine, anything in the middle. So the university started 10 years ago and it went quite well. And three years later, seven years ago, we decided, well, um, there is a whole wave uh, starting now. It was not that obvious, uh, but there, is a, there was a wave in 2014 on what you call nowadays food tech. Uh, the big fight of the humankind, which I know it sounds a little grand for this time, but it's probably uh, sustainability, uh, climate change. And climate change is basically three things. Um, the first wave, which is energy production, 55% of our carbon footprint. Mobility, which is 20% of our carbon footprint. That was the second wave with electrical, uh, electrical vehicles and uh, etc. And the third wave, which is coming here now, which is food, 20% of our carbon footprint. Uh, it just started three years ago. When we started Culinary Action seven years ago, we had this idea that this was coming. And the most important thing in every single sector when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship is talent. We are a university. We are a non-for-profit foundation created by all this bottom-up movement. So we thought, well, let's create the little tools that the entrepreneurs are going to require on food. Because food, in this third wave that is coming, requires different tools than other sectors in entrepreneurship and innovation. For example, if I have a fintech uh, startup, it's just digital. I mean, it's great, but it's digital. Food, food is a human experience, so you require to be validated by someone like us, because you know, it's food, you know, it's an experience. B, it's a human need. Uh, so this is something that is about inclusiveness as well. You have to have values, and I'm not saying that for marketing. Food, certainly it's different. You have to be more collaborative. With that in mind, we start creating different tools that will empower entrepreneurs, starting obviously in the Basque Country, then Spain, then Europe. Now I'm going to Tel Aviv next, next month. So that was the idea. First, the university, which is talent, and then a little tools, which is culinary, that we call it culinary action, because it sounds cool, uh, to, you know, empower entrepreneurs in the food tech and sector. I see, uh, you know, this bottom-up approach, was it an, an individual or, or an organization or, you know, <laughs> who, you know, you talked about the seed and the mind, like where did the seed come from, who was it or, you know, was it a group or? 
I, I, there was a group. I think I, I can point at different individuals that had the same idea at the same time. That's usually something that happens in every sector, right? There seems to be a synchronicity. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more powerful, as a French writer said once, than idea which time has come. Mm -hmm. And um, in 2014, I'm just going to give a number. Sorry, I'm an economist. I, I actually <laughs> don't know how to cook. Um, so, sorry, I have to come out of the closet. Um, in 2014, the whole um, investment in Europe in food tech startups was 27 million euros. 27 million euros in the whole of Europe in one sector, that's nothing, that's peanuts. It means there was no sector. That's 2014. 2020, six years later, is 2.2 billion. Wow. So that's literally a wave. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened in energy about 15 years ago with wind farms, solar, smart grids. Then fast forward six years later, about 10 years ago, mobility with electrical car, hybrids, hydrogen, it's coming on waves. And now it's the food tech wave. So a lot of people at that time, we had that in different areas, like, well, we have a university. Shouldn't we create something for food, for food entrepreneurs? Because at that time, food, I know it sounds, uh, time goes by rather quickly, but people thought that food and culinary and gastronomy, again, was just vocational training. It was something that, and now there's this whole new sector, this whole new brave world coming. So just to answer your question, it was a different people from within the uh, Basque Culinary Center, the university, and from abroad saying, we require, food is gonna require validating mechanisms because entrepreneurship in food is gonna be different from other sectors. By the way, actually there's a lot of, well, it's extremely, probably the majority is female uh, entrepreneurship. And I wanna keep it that way because you know it has happened in other sectors. Mm -hmm. Back in the days in Spain at least, IT used to be female in the 70s until, uh, until they put engineering in front of it. Mm -hmm and suddenly, you know, men came and pushed them around, and it was, so less uh, food, food tech, right now, it's actually a very open sector, it's different, it's collaborative, extremely female, so we're just glad that we created this, but we keep creating tools for, for the entrepreneurs. Excellent, excellent, we'll keep coming back to that. <laughs> Can I just check if we've got Jens on, online? No. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Ah, Jens, yeah, excellent. Oh, Jens, loud. I'm gonna move on to the discussion, right, because I'm conscious of time, um, this, the second block that we're talking about is the gathering the resources. And with the Open Entrepreneurship Initiative in Denmark, um, you know, we know it's an award-winning program. Uh, can you talk to us about you know, once the idea was, you know, had been created and people had got together and you'd identified your, your target market, how did you go about gathering the resources to make that happen? Yeah. Yeah, basically, I maybe should uh, introduce that the Open Entrepreneurship is about how we get more innovation out from our universities. The idea that we match experienced entrepreneurs very early with researchers and actually build teams before actually maturing the, the startup idea. Um, the gathering of resources for Open Entrepreneurship was basically uh, the Danish Industry Foundation, which is a private foundation which were out looking for new models for the like a traditional TTO tra transfer way of working. And, uh, and uh, they uh, met up with our uh, initial idea maker, Jes Boeing, to start the Open Entrepreneurship uh, Initiative. Um, and the, the next thing I would say with resources is of course how to, to, to gather the external entrepreneurs, uh, which uh, in our experience actually is quite uh, easy. A lot of people would like to engage and a lot of entrepreneurs have a heart for, for the university. Many come from there themselves. But maybe the more <clears throat> the harder part of it is, is, is how to match and make these initial teams work, which have uh, taken uh, a long while to, to learn and get uh, to, the, to the bottom of. Uh, but we are managing uh, at the moment. At the moment, we have like uh, five times as many external entrepreneurs connected to the program and then internal people uh, inside it. And yet, um, resources aren't just financial, right? Resources are also people, it can be access to networks. Your know, resources can be many things. So how did you take a broad view on what, what you mean by resources? Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, for this kind of program, I think the basic resource is main hours. Uh, and, and we would like to, to have the focus on these external people using the time with our pre-startup teams. So uh, a lot of this activity with the engaging, motivating, finding ideas, screening, and then uh, matching uh, have been the, the uh, pinpoint of it all. 
but uh, it wouldn't start off without an initial funding to get uh, the people ready and uh, organized and have a framework ready to how to do this. Okay, thank you, Jens. Uh, Beatrice, like, again, resources for you are the role models. Mm -hmm. I know there's financial resourcing, but the role models mm -hmm. are a huge element of your... Yes. Uh, you know, so how do you go about gathering those resources? How do you get people you know, to, to be role models, to go into the schools? Because you're doing this across France. Yes. Um, so that's quite a challenge. How do you, how do you, how do, you do that? Okay, we have, uh, at Summit Entrepreneur, we have, uh, you know, a real skills on mobilizing volunteers. And uh, we, uh, we're mobilizing them uh, throughout France and also, I told you, uh, overseas and, and on international. So it's a really a special skills. And at the beginning of this action uh, about uh, concerning uh, women entrepreneurship, we, uh, we had no money at the beginning. And um, we have the, the, the team, our existing team, and also our, our network. That is getting much more and more important. And uh, we also had lots of audacity, you know, and, uh, and also the, the will to, to impose, the, impose this, impose, sorry, this to the public authorities. And you know, in France, it's maybe it can be complica complicated because there is a real gap between enterprise and um, and um, at school, uh, between entrepreneurs and the school. So we had to impose that. But little by little, we get, you know, uh, different partners and uh, that uh, give us money, you know, like uh, public partners, like the ministers, and uh, also private partners like uh, companies or, or funded private foundation. And if we are talking about the cost to, to do the action, uh, we need to have uh, money, you know, to have a good organization, lots of process. It's a very processed action uh, because we have to be very focused and to do it uh, widely. And uh, we need uh, know-how to mobilize. We need um, uh, also uh, a very good digital uh, platform, matching platform. That's the point of the action um, because we need a platform for networking. And uh, we have entrepreneurs and teachers, you know, they are plugged on the platform and according to their request, uh, there is an affinity matching. So we need money for that. And, and just one thing, yeah. uh, today to, to raise a right uh, awareness of a, of a young person, it costs something like 10 euros per young person. And the more we mobilize and the more the price drops. Wow, wow. Voilà. Yeah, yeah, great. And of course, the other resource in that is schools and teachers and so yeah. forth. Yeah. And, and your initiative started with some funding from the ministry, but, but obviously it's grown since then. And, and so how do you gather the resources? And again, I'd like to think of resources being more than money. It's about people and, you know, and lots of other things. So intellectual property is a, is a resource. Yes, um, but even before we got the funding, uh, this funding had to be approved. So it took a while to convince and connect different ministries in Slovenia that uh, this project that, and creative sector in Slovenia is something that is worthwhile of supporting. And that by uh, creating a um, network uh, center that would connect the creative sector and empower them uh, is something that will be funded by the cohesion funding. So the first we had to start with networking and partnership with the ministries. Then we had to start and find the partners within the uh, ecosystem of uh, entrepreneurship because we already as a museum we were really active in the field of design architecture uh, culture of course and other creative sectors uh, so we started to develop this partnership network with other uh, entrepreneurial organizations organizations that are dealing with innovation in Slovenia but on the in the same time we were developing also partner network uh, with creative sector in Slovenia with creative hubs that were already existing and working in different uh, uh, in different um, places and regions in Slovenia so that the, the project was not designed as a centralized project in Ljubljana but also meant uh, to cover the whole Slovenia. Yeah, because that's what I find really interesting about your initiative because while it's Ljubljana based, you have built it out you know, to become a whole country initiative. And obviously that, and I know you're, you're abroad as well, we'll come back to that later, but you know, 
to make that happen, you've got to get buy-in from people across the country, don't you? Yes. And, yes. and how did you persuade people? So actually, we, we knew that the creative sector and creative hubs in Slovenia are our main partners. So we are the, the organization or project that is meant to support creatives. So we need creatives uh, to, to be uh, with us, to work with us and to tell us what they need. So uh, we made an open call uh, and invite creative organizations to propose the programs uh, that they think are important for the development of creative sector uh, within their scope of work. So meaning in the field of architecture, design, maybe music, uh, film and so on. So like specific subsectors. Uh, and with this, we now are working with around uh, 30 organizations, creative organizations around Slovenia. And we are together with them developing those programs. We are uh, somehow uh, programming them. We are co-producing them. So it's like a joint initiative Thanks. that would be not possible otherwise. And I, th I think the key point that we're trying to bring out here is that, you know, for any of this success to happen, it's not going to be organisational based. It's got to it's got to be inclusive. Uh, as here, I'm going to move on to pillar three because pillar three of, of our discussion is around key learning points. Mm -hmm. What were the kind of the key learning points for 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 you, and you know, what were the mistakes that you that were made? And I know every organisation has lots of mistakes. Yeah, how much time you have? <laughs> <laughs> but, but for the audience, both online and, and with us, you know, kind of what were the key learning points that you kind of say, look, you need to think about this. Um, yeah, this is going to sound familiar. I hope actually it sounds familiar. Um, food, much like your area, it's very horizontal. You can have everything. I mean, it's basically, you know, there's food design. I mean, it's uh, that it's uh, uh, STEM oriented. There's arts as well. It's almost as, uh, so. I guess one of the key things when I look at our uh, talent, and when I talk about talent, I mean, and I talk about global talent. We created something called Culinary Action International on the Road, which is basically like any other on the road. It's like international competition by which we go from one ecosystem to another ecosystem with local partners. We create a call and then we do a pitching contest and there is one winner per city: Madrid, Paris. Uh, I was in Copenhagen last week, Tel Aviv in a month. So I see entrepreneurs from all over the world on food tech and. One of the problems that entrepreneurs have on food tech, particularly actually in continental Europe, and, and bigger, the, the bigger the country, the bigger the mistake. And it is uh, in big countries such as France or Spain, um, Basque country, anyway. Uh, <laughs> entrepreneurs quite often don't think on internationalizing soon enough. <coughs> Why? Because they feel comfy, you know. It's France, it's Spain, it's Germany, it's 80 million people. Uh, quite often, that's a big mistake. Uh, you go to Helsinki or Tel Aviv, they internalize from day to day. Why? Because otherwise it's not going to make sense. Somehow on food, it's actually even worse because it's not digital. The um, challenge of, interna of going global is actually larger. And I understand if uh, digital is easier to scale it up. Scaling up food, depending on what your solution is, it can be quite a challenge. And that's, that's no, no discussion there. Having said that, if you are talent, you are uh, looking into food tech sector, and you come from a big European country, I, I know it's just think on your country for first couple of years at most on your PNL. Go global, go European at the very least, because there are other ecosystems that are going global with their solutions, and they're going to become the standard unless you do so. So the first mistake I see is not going global soon enough, and usually there is a correlation. The bigger the country, the bigger the mistake. Uh, uh, just as a, so, the, so the people understand correctly, because very often when we talk about culinary action, yeah. people think restaurants, right? <laughs> you know, that's not what we're talking about here. You've yeah. helped 75 startups, yeah. but it's around food product. It's yeah. around Everything. products that are, mm -hmm. are, are supporting yes. food yes. Um, creation, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it's not restaurants. I want to be clear not on that. Not only. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's uh, as a sector, um, in, and in Europe, I will say, is our largest, is our biggest challenge, and also is our biggest comparative advantage. Uh, let me explain this. When you talk about gastronomy, uh, people think on just on au cuisine and, and culinary part, chefs basically, which is great. Um, is the sensorial part of of the sector, 
But gastronomy, gastronomy 360, as we call it, is everything. It's everything related with food. Being actually related, or the fact that people relate uh, gastronomy, in particular Europe, uh, with just, just restaurants or chefs, it's a, obviously it's, it's a challenge. But on the other hand, it's actually, it can be an advantage point because every single solution that comes on food, except for a couple of digital uh, things, are going to require the validation, because it's a food experience, of the sensorial part. Sensorial part being related. So if I say in a pitching, just imagine I'm a startup, and I say, well, I have a food tech startup, and I come from, I'm, I'm going to be politically correct. I'm going to go to some points and just think on a place which is not culinary advanced, OK? <laughs> so probably I'm going to have to be a little bit longer on my pitching, because you know my ecosystem is not good at food or is not related. However, if I say I have a food tech solution which has a new molecule or a new protein, which is vegetable-based protein, which can replace meat, but it tastes like chicken somehow, and it's delicious. And I say I come from Italy, or Basque country, or France. OK, my pitching becomes shorter. It's like having a cyber, a cyber security uh, startup and coming from Tel Aviv. Well, that makes sense. So uh, I'm going back to yes. Gastronomy 360 is everything related with food. Yes, unfortunately, people tend to believe it's just the restaurant part, the old cuisine. But having that sometimes perception is not so bad because it means that uh, startups and entrepreneurs can profit from that if you manage well. Because senses, sensorial, is important on food. Okay. Jens, I'm going to bring you back in here because, again, as an award winning program, um, you know, we'd be interested in the critical learning points and the critical kind of lessons that you've learned, you know, with, yeah. with open entrepreneurship and what you do in DTU Skylab. So what can you share? Yeah, basically, I can share that uh, we need to go out and help uh, our researchers at our universities to commercialize the inventions. We can get a much bigger output from universities if we work with them by taking experienced entrepreneurs and mass them in uh, early. Uh, some of the uh, experience we have had is that if we insist on researchers themselves bringing it out, they seldom endure these startups. Uh, on the other hand, we also uh, have experienced that we, we need to screen and make sure the mindset of the external entrepreneurs when coming in are the right one. If they are very focused on very quickly going to market or what is the value of this uh, next year, that's maybe not. We need someone with a respect for the academic environment and maybe a heart for, for helping society through the universities. Um, besides that, I think an internal learning is that uh, going from a project, a program to more like a, a cultural changing uh, lighthouse kind of uh, Example in Denmark is a journey we have been through. Uh, many look to us now, and uh, there's more talk of like best practices. What framework are we building on? And and the next step where we are trying to find partners uh, outside of Denmark in Europe uh, uh, will will hopefully uh, um, even further that. Jens, I got a tough question for you. Right. Ah, <laughs> come, I'm ready. <laughs> what mistake did you make? that you would not repeat? Uh, yeah. What mistake did we make? Um, I think that uh, we had a, had a, a, a long learning phase, I think, uh, but it's always uh, easy to look in the rearview mirror and, and, and be wise. But I think there's a lot of uh, building up small uh, uh, local initiatives which were not very in sync with others and how to make this uh, scaling uh, phase where we work across that could have been done smoother and, and quicker in my opinion. Okay, okay, very good, very good. Um, I'm conscious of time, I'm conscious of allowing opportunity for questions from the audience and also for, from people online. So I'm going to move to the final pillar and ask each of the four panelists um, one of the things that I've noticed in all of the initiatives is that all of you have gone international, right? All of you have expanded um, internationally. So in terms of, again, I'm thinking of the people in the audience, if they're starting an initiative, making it sustainable over a period of time is quite a challenge. Yeah. So 
how did you think about sustainability? How did you think about creating something that you know, would, would, would go beyond three years? Um, Beatrice, I'll start with you. Yes, um, you know, we are a lot of plans for the future of, uh, of our action. And uh, next year, it will be the 10th edition of the action, the anniversary uh, edition. And we will do a lot of uh, events to celebrate this. And uh, we plan to organize that uh, more than 1,500 um, meetings, you know, and to, um, to sensitize more than 50, thousand young people so it's a, it's a strong ambition for the for the next year and uh, we will also carry out a qualitative and quantitative impact measurement you know uh, by a specialized firm because uh, this will allow us to improve the methodology we, uh, we created and uh, to measure the effect of testimonial or the change of uh, mindset uh, of the, the young girls. And um, we also, you know, in the three next year and six next year, we have a scale-up um, plan for more impact because uh, what we want on our action is to change mindset. So we need to have a, a strong impact and uh, it's a long-term uh, action. And in six years, we plan to organize female entrepreneurs meet meeting for 300,000 young people every year you know it's a question of, uh, of generation and uh, this is a part of our overrun plan to scale up for a greater impact and um, the objective as i said is to be massive massive and um, and to change mentalities and um, we need to have uh, more entrepreneurs you know to face major change in the world in this world and uh, such as environment health and peace and so it's great to have uh, lots of women for that I, I don't say only women. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The equality between men and women for that. So this is uh, the Beatrice. I was mm. reading your website. The, the statistics on impact are, are superb. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's, it's we, like, we work on it. <laughs> yeah, and like, the, the numbers are, are, are astonishing in terms of, of impact. Um, does that help you to sell your message to get more resources to become more sustainable? So when you do the research and you get that feedback, does that help you or is that the reason you've done it? Or you know, um, how, how does the results help you to become more sustainable? Uh, the, the result we had? Yeah. Yes. We, um, okay. we, are, we have lots of, uh, we measure the success and we, are, we have lots of indicators and each, uh, each year we compare it to see if there is a, a, a progress. Mm. And, um, and we also have qualitative indicators. That's why the question just... Yeah, 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 sorry. yeah. <laughs> We have uh, indicator, um, qualitative indicators and we make uh, feedback posts. And we have two important indicators, you know, like the evolution of the desire to be an entrepreneur and uh, before the meetings and after the meetings. And we make the comparison. And uh, if, if here we notice that it's growing. And uh, we also another have another indicati um, indicator that is, did young people find female entrepreneurs accessible or inspiring or incredible? And here it's important uh, that the female entrepreneur seems to be accessible rather than incredible because you uh, identify better with an accessible person than an incredible person. You, know, mm -hmm. you say, oh, if you say this woman, this person is just incredible, but it's not for me, so it won't work. But if you say, if you think that, oh, this woman is amazing and maybe I can do it and I will do like her. And on this side, on this, uh, um, on this case, it would work. So we, we measure that. But next year we will uh, measure it deeply and, uh, and we will um, do a lot of polls for that with a special company. Okay, excellent, excellent. <laughs> the, the, the numbers are fantastic. Okay. Really, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, in terms of building sustainability and building it over a long period of time. What were the challenges and how did you go about that? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, 
from my or our point of view, uh, acknowledging the existing initiatives that are already on the field is vital to build alliances so that uh, uh, you have partners that support the idea, uh, like for in our case, the idea of development and support of the creative sector. Um, because the mindset changes take time, uh, so uh, and also to somehow develop the entrepreneurship spirit within the culture and creative sector takes time, so you have to have uh, on your side organizations which are dealing that. On the other hand, uh, we build the sustainability not only of our organization with the uh, key performance indicator and numbers we have, but we also want to uh, make the sector sustainable. So therefore, we we uh, share the knowledge, uh, so we empower them, we give them tools to know how they can develop their own businesses, where can they re uh, find the additional resources, whether financial, whether knowledge, partnerships, network. And um, I, what I also find very important for our sector, for creative sector, is that we should uh, really um, build on what we do so good, and this is to open up the minds of the people, that we are really encouraging um, uh, different uh, perspectives and opening up uh, different futures, maybe, because this is something uh, that creative sector is so good at, to imagine something new that does not exist. And to imagine something new, uh, you have to be able to recognize that someone can do that in a moment when it doesn't exist yet. So. And, and yeah, one of the challenges I find working in the creative sector is the, 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 the clash between creativity and commercialization. Yes. Um, and one of the things I really like about your work is the holistic approach that you've taken. But you've also gone international. Uh, why did you feel the need to expand beyond the borders of, of Slovenia? Well, Slovenia is really small with only 2 million people and uh, although we developed the financial uh, support to the creatives and we developed this educational support to the creatives, we saw that uh, our sector through the research that we are al also doing that the sector uh, is not tackling internationalization seriously enough and there's a lot of potential so um, this was also somehow based on the research or the needs of the sector uh, that in 80 percent they would like to tackle the internationalization more so uh, we we quickly realized that while working in Slovenia it's very important that this is the base that going abroad and present what Slovenian creatives are doing abroad and creating networks abroad, presenting their work, uh, connecting to other organizations is vital to the support of the sector and the organization as well. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, as yeah, also for you, building sustainability. Like one of the, again, the interesting things about your program or, and your work is that like 60% or more of your students come from abroad now. Mm -hmm. Um, so how did you build sustainability? How did, how did that mindset, you know, you talked about it a little earlier about, you know, we got to go international, but okay. yeah. So, but in terms of building sustainability, what were your thoughts? Yeah, as an organization, how you, well, there's a whole movement, as I said, uh, from change and coming in the food sector or gastronomy. Um, one way would be, um, being a Basque, I guess we'll have a little Jesuit inside, like, much like the Irish. Just go and still, you know, spreading the word and evangelize, uh, which is a part of it. Uh, the other one is actually, an, uh, it's just looking for allies. Uh, I think uh, while I go to different ecosystems, actually I was in the Boeing Valley. Oh yeah, uh, I lived there. Yeah, yeah, that was a two weeks ago, uh, celebrating Samhain. And um, there's a movement there from the producer's perspective that want to create a center of gastronomy, but looking at the producers, at uh, agriculture. Uh, going to Israel, as I said, and there's the same similar move, talking to Japan about the same thing. So the first thing is like, mm, we have to go global. There is a need and there's an opportunity. How we can go global? Uh, I think, uh, again, our belief is, my belief actually too, is just by looking with partners, global partners, that share the values, share the vision, and we can co-create something. I mean, this is not going to be franchising. This is not going to be, I mean, also because I think, I really do believe that it has to be in a different way because food is global and it's local at the same time. Everyone eats, everyone has a gastronomic culture. Everyone has a perception. So it couldn't be anything more global. It couldn't be more local too. So following these little hints, 
I think the way of going international in a sustainable way is by that, by looking to different ecosystems, which as I said, at the same time, there is this synchronicity. They see the need of creating um, university level, uh, the, not just degrees, but the ways that of empowering their talent and creating other tools. We are more than glad at co-creating them with them. So just looking at your right partners globally and co-creating with them. What's really interesting about the language there, folks, is that cooperation, co-creation, optimization, where do we hear that? Just last night with our guest speaker, the mm. Schumpeter, yep. who was very much right. talking that language. Um, I'm going to ask Jens for his comments, and, and then after that, I'd like to take some questions either online or, or from the audience. Uh, Jens, in terms of sustainability, what were the lessons that, that you learned? What, you know, what was your thinking around building something that was sustainable over a long period of time? Yeah, uh, I think the basic truth, if you work on something that is more or less a cultural change effort, is that if you're success and you go away, you, you are still there in, in essence that people change and you'll make a lasting uh, impact. But we're not away yet. Uh, we are still in, in a transformation uh, process. So I think our motivation is now to build further uh, and like uh, the other speaker, it's go global if, if needed. But at the moment, uh, I think one step at a time, we are actually looking for uh, partners. So if any of the spe listeners here uh, want to, to know more, please reach out. Okay. And um, so any questions from the audience? Can I take any questions? One at a time, please. Um, okay, and I see there's none online just at the minute. Um, please, any? Okay, while we're uh, waiting for a question and people are shy, uh, last comments, right, from each of the panelists. To the audience, what words of advice? So what word of advice would you offer, you know, in terms of this bottom-up approach making it happen, let's go do it. <laughs> okay, I will have short advice, you know. Um, when you want to change mentality, you have to be first to be patient, and you have to be organized, and you have to be ambitious. So that's, that's uh, my advice. And I will be very happy to, to speak with person that want to implement this action in their, in their countries because we can have discussion. We have lots of know-how that we can share. And, uh, and we are thinking of uh, uh, implementing the action in countries like with franchising and uh, help, with the help of our, um, you know, our, um, our method and our platform. So I would be very happy to, to share that. Okay, that's very generous. Thank you, Anya. Uh, connect, build the alliances, uh, and build on the existing, what already exists, uh, and think beyond the short-term uh, effects or results, and uh, see the long-term uh, effects that will, or results that will develop, uh, and go global and connect and share, co-create with other organizations, uh, partners from abroad. Okay. Very good, thank you. Asia? Uh, I guess uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, and this is someone who has never been an entrepreneur, but uh, has been, I've been with many, uh, and I've been creating tools for them, can be lonely, uh, I guess. Uh, but having said that, I think there has never been a better time to be an entrepreneur in Europe. There are so many tools, there are so many organizations trying to create to empower you both uh, from a gender perspective, from a creative perspective, from a food perspective. So A, is not going to be as lonely as it used to be. B, quite frankly, having worked in everything under the spectrum except being an entrepreneur, uh, corporate, consulting, university now, even public sector, I think actually is one of the nicest mistakes you can make. I mean, if you are an entrepreneur for a couple of years and it doesn't work, uh, quite frankly, I think it's one of the best things, one of the best mistakes you can do. Um, who knows? You might succeed, so try it. It's, honestly, I think it's one of the nicest mistakes you can make, and there's never been so many networks, there's never been so many uh, ways of empowering and making you, help, and help you in that, in that process, in that journey. The problem is going to be scale it up, but that's a whole different deal, and probably we're going, we can leave that discussion for some other time. Actually, just on that point of you know, trying it and failing, I think the culture is changing on that. I think failure is becoming more acceptable, and people have understood that, you know, that 
I, I know from research that high growth firms are more likely to be founded by people with prior startup experience. Mm. Okay, so having done it and failed, okay, you know, you've learned your mistakes, go again. And the example I often quote is Ray Kroc of McDonald's, who had 10 failures before he succeeded. Um, okay, Jens, the final word to you, final words of advice. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think uh, getting these people, as you t t talk about with this experience of how to make startup connect with people with these unique ideas and, and very special insights, I think is what we really need at the moment. We need some of these deep tech university inventions to come out and make a difference. So we need the entrepreneurs to go in and make the teams. So. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jens, and, and right on time um, and drawing to a close. Uh, the, the idea behind today is that I would argue too many people point the finger at government, point the finger at European Commission and say, look, it's their responsibility, they should be doing it, it's not, you know. My, my own philosophy, my own belief is that we're all responsible, we all can do something. And examples from here are bottom-up approaches that have been successful that have made a difference in the countries in which they've operated. And really, okay, what's coming across is you can make it happen, go for it, but it can only happen through co-creation, co partnerships, cooperation. But we do know there's lots of support available. And one of the things I think we all know in this room is that successful entrepreneurs are very giving. Okay, and it's certainly been my experience, and I suspect your experience, that if you go to successful entrepreneurs looking for their support in these initiatives, generally, they tend to be very giving and supportive of what you're looking to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. So go make it happen. We're behind you. There's people who are willing to offer their advice, and they're available to talk to you. Um, and my final words are, see you tonight at the EPA ceremony, where we will discover which one of the three will be this year's winner of Category 1 of the EPA? Thank you very much and see you tonight. Good luck.